Hi, I'm Kelvin Anderson, owner of the world famous VIP Records in Long Beach. Been in business now for like 32 years here in Long Beach and uh, been instrumental in the uh, success of a lot of artists today. R&B, gospel, jazz, blues, reggae, and of course hip hop. I originally came to uh, California right out of high school in 1972. My uh, older brother Cletus Anderson started VIP Records back in 1967. So uh, uh, every time one of his brothers would finish high school, they would come to California and work with him in the music business. So in 72, I came out May 24th. Uh, the same day I made it here, I went to work in the music business. So from 72 until 79, uh, that's where I got my degree in the music business. Seven years of uh, on the job experience. And uh, I actually opened this door up for him of uh, the Long Beach location in June of 78. And six months later, January of 79, I bought it from him. So I've actually owned the store since January 1979. One thing about you know VIP Records, it was a, always a very well-known uh, music store. Uh, I would say that over the uh, seven years that I worked for my brother, we opened up at least around 14 locations in and around the you know Los Angeles area, and uh, we were so popular because uh, we nobody marketed and promoted the way we did. Nobody seemed to have the knowledge of, of the music the way we did and uh, and we always had the best prices so uh, we were very aggressive in you know uh, our service to our customers and community and uh, you know we was like key in you know all of the urban in music genre such as you know gospel jazz blues reggae and uh, we were the first one of the first, uh, probably the first, to really embrace uh, rap and hip hop. Uh, you know, thinking back, you know, my early recollection of rap was definitely like uh, Sugar Hill Gang. If I would say the first rap song that I heard was probably Rapper's Delight. Uh, we did real good with it, even though we know major radio wasn't touching it and stuff. We knew that it was something that. You know, it was it was like something that you know black people finally invented. Even though we know gospel come from black people, blues come from black people, but rap was you know something different, and uh, it was something <clears throat> that we kind of had locks on because uh, the chain stores, the your pop stores, they wasn't touching it. So uh, you know, it was something that you know we could be really be proud of, and you know, rap in this beginning wasn't hardcore, wasn't threatened, it was more or less uh, somebody's talent and skills into, uh, you know, in being, uh, in rhyming basically. So uh, we were very, as a ch chain of uh, retail stores, very instrumental in the beginning stages of rap. The early groups, EPMD and Grandmaster Flash, uh, the fact that the uh, music was based on old school R&B. Hey, you know, that was kind of a win-win situation because, you know, uh, Zap, James Brown, all of those people, you know, is produced hit songs that we all grew up with and stuff. So to take their music and put, you know, a rap with a, a really catchphrase hook you kind of had a hit record and stuff, so uh, we were proud, you know, to be a part of launching that, you know, form of music, you know, back in the day. I would say that how it kind of got to the West Coast and Long Beach. I was around with uh, Easy E in the uh, Boys in the Hood days. I can still remember that, like maybe maybe twice a week, Easy would roll through in his low rider. And I would pick up a couple of boxes of 12 inches from him. And, uh, you know, that 
you know, and again, that was something that we were playing in-house, promoting, and that was something that radio wasn't touching. And uh, a lot of people don't know that one of the uh, reasons that Easy was so successful and known kind of all over the world was that he was with the scandalous company. Uh, Macola Records was really scandalous. And, but they did something for Easy that Easy couldn't have bought or paid for at that time because uh, what they did was they knew that they had something. <clears throat> so they basically prostituted his music all over the world. And I know that they did and stuff because uh, we would get calls from Germany, uh, from England, you know, more, mostly military guys who was like, you know, who is this easy guy and stuff and would be trying to order it. And so that means that it was some kind of way, you know, it got into the military bases all over the world. And, uh, you know, I mean, that type of marketing somebody from the neighborhood couldn't have possibly got that so it was a it was a bad thing to turn into a good thing you know for him because uh, he got that exposure that he could never purchase himself so uh, so then there come you know easy in the Compton scene and stuff so I would say West Coast wise the next area to blow up was uh, the Bay Area with Too Short E-40 and all of those guys and stuff so the after Compton blew up, then Oakland and the Bay blew up. So, uh, don't know how I ran into this guy or how we hooked up, but uh, I ran into a guy, uh, uh, everybody knows him as Sir Jinx. And Jinx told me, he said, man, I hear that you uh, want to start uh, uh, producing and working with artists in Long Beach. And so he said, I can help you get that started. So, uh, Jeans took me over to Dr. Dre's house, and so he showed me this machine and stuff. He said, you see this machine right here? He said, this is all you need to make it happen. And so I said, what is it? He said, it's an SP-1200 drum machine. He said, it belongs to Dre, and he said, the closest I can get to it is over his shoulder. He said, you know, he won't let me get down with it and nothing like that. He said, but I know that that's all you need to make records. So uh, me and Jeep went down to the Guitar Center and I remember paying $24.95 for a brand new SB1200 drum machine. And I gave it to him. And uh, I'll say right on three months later, he came to me, he said, okay, we ready. And he had a homeboy named Dazzy D uh, that he grew up with. So the first little project he did was with his homeboy like a two cut single and stuff and so then jeans came to long beach and uh, i had a couple guys working with me that uh, he taught how to use and program the drum machine and uh one of the guys was went by dj slice who uh in turn kind of took over you know working with the long beach artists uh i'll never forget that uh he uh, uh, was very instrumental in putting together the now famous uh, Snoop Dogg demo that uh, Dre uh, Warren took to uh, Dre's birthday party back in the day, and he played it at Dre's birthday party. And Dre asked him, "Man, who is that?" And something. So Warren said, "It's my homeboy Snoop that I've been trying to tell you about." And uh, Dre was so taken by the project. Uh, to by what he heard on the uh, on the uh, demo till uh, the next day, uh, Dre was working on the soundtrack to the Deep Cover movie, and uh, one of the hit songs on the movie was a 187 that featured Snoop Dogg and stuff. And so that's basically you know where Snoop Dogg musical career was launched from the uh, 187 soundtrack. It was kind of funny because uh, that same four cut demo uh, project that uh, Dre heard was the same one that I sent to all the other labels. I had even sent it to Interscope, uh, Jive, Tommy Boy, all the other labels that was feeling rapping. You know, during that time I submitted this demo to 
I, and so it was like after the success of uh, 187 on the Deep Cover soundtrack, these same labels was calling me saying, hey, Kelvin, you in Long Beach, who's this new doggy dog guy? And I would just text, tell them to ask the a and department because they all had demos and packages on Snoop. And uh, not only, you know, and they seemed to be, you know, highly respect me for the fact that, you know, our ability to sell music, but evidently they didn't think that I was too good at picking talent because, like I said, all of the, everybody that we submitted the project to turned it down. So, uh, uh, so then, you know, that led to Snoop being signed by uh, uh, Death Row and uh, uh, after doing the 187 and after being featured on Dr. Dre's Chronic album, then uh, it led to uh, Snoop's first release where he uh, did uh, his first single on the roof of the store here, uh, What's My Name, which uh, led to uh, uh, VIP Records being world famous because uh, it was a video that was shown all around the world and to this day uh, we're still recognized for that video and uh, other videos that have been shot here. The uh, original studio that we uh, had at that time was, uh, it was basically a room that was a storage room that I had converted and stuck some equipment in. So the original Snoop demo tape was basically done with the uh, SB-1200 drum machine, two turntables and a cassette deck. We did later on open up a full flash uh, 32 track studio that we have for several years here, but once the studio became a laptop, we kind of got rid of the studio because most of the producers that I was working with at that time was basically doing most of the music at home. Uh, we would uh, uh, only go into a full studio to do live music. Or, well, it hasn't been easy. I would say that, you know, anybody that's in the business of selling physical uh, music such as CDs, DVDs, uh, they're definitely on life support. And I will say that for the last couple of years we've been on life support and stuff. So, uh, it's just not many places that you can find physical CDs and even with us, uh, uh, we have a nice selection here but if we don't have it, uh, we are able to let you know whether or not we can get it. And then normally if we can get it, we can get it in a day or so, like 48 hours at least. One thing I like to say about, you know, VIP Records and uh, especially this store in Long Beach, uh, I kind of feel like that we will probably be the last man standing as far as uh, uh, music business is concerned. You know, we can't stop change. And over the years, I've seen a lot of changes. You know, we changed from the eight track to the cassette. We changed from the cassette to the CD. And every time there was change, uh, there was another physical replacement. But with, after the CD, is no physical replacement. We got Cassie in the neighborhood now that has a new project that once they download it on the internet and uh, uh, once we load it onto our system as available to sell, you know, we uh, sell it. We get calls from Germany, Japan, all over for independent local cats here in the neighborhood. So uh, without the internet, that wouldn't be possible. So once again, I'm Kelvin Anderson, owner of the world famous VIP Records here on the east side of Long Beach. Give us a call, drop us a line, email us at uh, VIPLB at AOL.com. You can find us on Facebook on the VIP Records. Phone number here is 562-591-2349. And uh, give us a shot. Peace.